You were enjoying that, Brian, weren't you? I have a radio station that plays Jimi Hendrix. You're all right with me. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a big figure for you in your uh, in your formative years, wasn't he? Yeah, and, and always will be. I mean, there's magic there. What a beautiful sound on that guitar. It's very interesting. The version I'm hearing on my laptop here is um, there's no drums on that version. So I could hear the vocal incredibly clearly. And he says, will the wind ever remember the names it has blown in the past? I thought it was known. I didn't realise. What a <laughs> lovely bit of lyric. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a picture of Hendrix in, in your book. And also, I'm delighted to say on the same page, Rory Gallagher, who perhaps doesn't get as much attention yeah. as he deserves. Absolutely, yeah. I love Rory. What a fantastic performer. And a, what a spiritual guy. And, and, and just the nicest gentleman you could possibly meet. Yeah. So, so um, Brian May's Red Special, the story of the homemade guitar that rocked Queen in the world, came out yesterday. Uh, on the 50th anniversary of the guitar, although I believe you started to work on it with your dad in 63, didn't you? Yeah, that's probably right. It's hard to actually pin down an anniversary. Yeah. But yeah, it is about 50 years. My God. <laughs> <laughs> when did that time go? Well, do you know what, Brian? I looked it up this morning. I thought, when was the first time I saw Queen? And you were, uh, I saw Queen supported by a band called Nuts at Manchester University. It was 60 pence. And I looked it up on one of those sites. 20th of March, 1974. Well, you were there? I was there. I was 16. And so I had to lie about my age to get in. <laughs> you said you were younger, right? 60p, I was... <laughs> <laughs> but the guitar... The, you, you say it's hard to pin it down, but it, what's, what's striking about this book is how much stuff you have retained. Yeah. You, the family archive seems remarkable. It's amazing. Well, I had some great help, you know, because I tend to keep everything, but I can't find it. But uh, mm. I have a great person, Greg Brooks, here, who organises my uh, kind of archive of Queen stuff and personal stuff as well. So he was able to find all sorts of stuff which I thought was gone forever. So, I mean, the, I have to say this book has come out in response to other people working. You know, most of the books I do, I pour over and, and drive myself nuts. But this one really, um, uh, Simon piloted and pushed through and Carlton Books said we want this book and we want it now so it, they made it happen and uh, of course I put lots of input in but it was very painless for me we just yeah. did it by interviews and, and at the very last moment I had a chance to get in there and do some editing and yeah. fill in the little gaps which I thought were there. But there are your original notes and drawings that you and your father made. Yeah, well, as I say, I do keep everything. Yeah. yeah. So Sometimes should, it's a problem. <laughs> we should say then, this is the famous guitar that anyone who's who's seen you down the years will know. A uh, famous guitar with its very own tone, the red special, as you've later christened it, that you've played at so many uh, important events and on all the Queen records. And yeah. I was thinking, it's nowadays. It'd be very fashionable to do what you did then now in these days of sustainability and stuff like that. But it was unheard of then to make a guitar kind of from scratch from in a kind of also almost wartime make do a men spirit, wasn't it? It was what we used to call Heath Robinson almost. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had no money. I mean, that, that's why we made the guitar. We couldn't possibly buy a Stratocaster or a Gibson. Well, we were speculating so, about this. When they, like, you know, Hank Marvin got the first Strat in England. It's the price of a house or at least a car anyway. Oh, yeah, it was unimaginable. I mean, used to go in the shops and see them on the wall and not be allowed to touch them. That's yeah. What it was when you were a kid in those days. And you could see the brochures, you know. But there was no way I could have owned one of those things. So we decided we'd make the guitar, me and my dad. And, and how did you get the shape? Because the shape has never... It seems from, from, from looking at the book, there were no prototypes. You seem to sort of, more or less, just hit on this design straight away. Well, actually, we did do quite a bit of experimentation, but the shape I did myself, I thought, well, I will start from first principles. What it's supposed to be is a Spanish guitar shape with cutaways, and I wanted the double cutaway so I could really get to the, the dusty end of the... Uh, fingerboard yeah. uh, so I did my own shape and I you know sat there for quite a long time figuring it out and um, that became my guitar shape you know sort of a special shape and famously uh, some of it is uh, from a, a friend's old fireplace yeah it was all made from stuff that was lying around and it was a hundred year old fireplace a piece of that that I made the neck out of and all with hand tools you know chisels and planes and spoke shaves and sandpaper and um, the the main strain is taken by the body, which is a piece of, you know, there's, there's an insert into the body, which is an, a piece of oak, which I have to say was as hard as steel and incredibly <laughs> hard to work. But that was from an ancient oak table that we had. I mean, they don't make oak like that these days. You know, they cut the trees down quite early. But in those days, you know, that was well seasoned and yeah. that was probably 100 years old as well. Wow. So is it very heavy? 
It's not as heavy as a Gibson Les Paul. Right, okay. Uh, it, but, you know, it has some weight to it. It has less weight because I put these acoustic pockets in it, so a lot of it's hollowed out. Right. And that's very deliberate to try and make it feed back in uh -huh. the right way. So I claim to be the first person to make a an electric guitar that was designed to feedback <laughs> rather than not feedback. Yeah. 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 And uh, does it have a massive, I think in, in the book it says it's got a massive neck. So is the neck, because, you know, because you, perhaps you were saying, you know, tooling the wood was very difficult. Is the neck thicker than, than you would normally expect on a guitar? It's quite thick and some people are surprised when they pick it up, but I like it that way. And yeah. it was actually modelled on the old acoustic I had when I was a kid. And um, I have quite long fingers, so it works yeah. for me. I, I like to have a, something to get hold of. Yeah. Leaving aside kind of technical uh, detail, one, one would imagine that as well as anything else about the guitar, for you, it, it must be suffused with feelings about, about you and your dad making it and you and your dad and how you had... I mean, it's fair to say, your dad wasn't at all convinced that the rock star life was the one you should be pursuing, was he? No, it's a kind of irony at the time, you know, he was very much pro making the guitar and he loved to do stuff and it was a great bonding experience, yeah. you can imagine, for some father and son. But he hated the idea that I was giving up my career, as he saw it, you know, and never getting a proper job and going off to be a pop star. He just could not compute that and it was so hard for him, you know, it was about a year and a half before he could really get over it and he only got over it because he saw... Us at Madison, Madison Square Garden, Garden yeah. and I flew him out there, and I, I've told this story a lot, you know, but he, he, he saw it, and suddenly he, he came over to me afterwards and said, OK, I get it now, you know, <laughs> I understand why you had to do this. <laughs> that would kind of convince you, wouldn't it, <laughs> at Madison yeah, Square Garden? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was great. It's a wonderful moment for me. I bet, yeah. And do you still, do you still play this guitar all the time? Or oh, is, yeah. Yeah? Every day, pretty much every day of my life, and, unless the guitar's in a different city from where I am, which does happen. Yeah. <laughs> When that, when that happens, Brian, do you, are, you, are you a little nervous? Are you a little sweaty palmed about it if it's not in, in within where you can see it? I, I used to be, but now, you know, Pete, Pete Malandrone has, has looked after it for, for many years. He's been like a personal bodyguard as well as technician to that guitar. So he's fantastic, you know, he's, he's probably safer in his hands than it is in mine. Yeah, yeah. and people would assume you have kind of racks of these things backstage, <laughs> but this is, the, this is the one. This is the one. I do have a few spares backstage, you yeah. know, and I have a couple of different tunings. And, of course, we make Brian make Of course, so yeah, yeah. I'm able to use a couple of those on stage, and they're yeah. great. But, yeah. you know, the original is something. It's, it's like a piece of my body. Yeah, know? well, indeed. And the, the, the dot markers are made out of shirt buttons and all that. We're going to play a yeah. track with you. Why did you start using a, um, a sixpence as a pick? And do, you, and do you still do that? I still do that. Yeah, I used to use very bendy picks because I thought it was good for getting speed. But I gradually discovered that I wanted more and more hardness in the in the in the in the pick, in the yeah. plate, as we used to call it. Yeah. And the more rigid it is, the more you feel what's happening at the string in your fingers. So in the end, I, I picked up a coin, and it was just perfect. That's all I needed. Um, and I changed the way that I held the pick, sort of bending one of the fingers round, and. I never went back from, from that point. The sixpence has another great advantage. It's hard enough to be, you know, give you all that contact. It's also soft enough not to break your steel string, strings because it's, it's made of nickel, silver or whatever. And it has this lovely serrated edge. And mm. if you turn it at an angle to the strings, you get a lovely kind of splutter. So to me, the, the guitar is like a voice and that splutter is the consonants that, that helps to make the guitar talk. And is that demonstrated by this, the intro, the guitar intro to keep yourself alive? You know what? It is really well. <laughs> <laughs> and, this, and, the, and this is number one in the American rock charts right now. Yeah, I was thrilled to find that out. This week it's number one in the classic rock charts or whatever it is. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's really nice. It was yeah. a, a re-release. Well, yeah, right. so it was a very early track. It's, it's pretty much the first Queen track, really. Well, yeah, yeah, it opens the first album. Well, it, well, here's Brian on a bit of a table, a bit of a mantelpiece, and playing with a sixpence on Keep Yourself Alive. <laughs> Uh, keep Yourself Alive, uh, Brian May, uh, wrote that album, the first Queen album, Brian is with us. We'll go, we, we're going to move on to talk about the other book, The Poor Man's Picture Gallery, Brian, but I, yeah. I, I've always wondered um, why John Deacon has never featured in any of the, uh, sort of the, the versions of Queen that you and Roger have taken out there. John just has a choice, uh, you know, he's exercised his right to opt out and uh, he's in approval of what we do and, yeah. uh, you know, we have that from him the whole time and... Um, uh, he just doesn't want to, to be out there. He doesn't feel able to cope with, with the pressure. And yeah. I think that's, that's right and proper mm. that he can make that choice. It's a shame. I mean, we do miss him a lot, but yeah. that's yeah. the way he wants it. Okay. Christian Corley, my word. 
Christian Collis says, I thought I'd never hear Keep Yourself Alive on British Radio. <laughs> uh, apologies to the neighbours, suggesting that Christian crank that <laughs> right up. And Phil says, totally the best Queen song ever. <laughs> so uh -oh. we're talking to Brian May, we've been talking about the Red Special. Brian's got another book out as well. Now, am I pronouncing this word right, Brian? Stereoscopy? Exactly, it oh. is stereoscopy, otherwise known as 3D. Yes. Yeah, because it sounds medical for the uninitiated, yes. so you better start yeah. by explaining stereoscopy. Well, it's what we experience every day with our two eyes instead of one. You know, there's, a, there's an incredible miracle takes place, really, because our two eyes give our brains two different pictures of the universe, and every second of our waking life, those two pictures are merged in our brains to make a kind of 3D picture which is assembled in our, our brains. You know, so we see in solidity. We don't see flat. So that's what stereoscopy is. And it's always surprised me that because we kind of take that for granted why would we have you know why would be why would we be happy with flat pictures in mm. paintings and photographs why wouldn't we go for stereoscopy which is really reproducing that experience and, and giving you a, a three-dimensional picture of some place which perhaps you've never been and this was a this was a big craze in victorian times we're sort of the 1850s 1860s here aren't we exactly yeah it coincides with the birth of photography itself uh, stereoscopy was right there in the beginning, invented by a lovely man called Charles Wheatstone in 1838. And, and you it's amazing. Sorry. And, and you started collecting things, because, and, and I think your, in, your interest in it was sparked by something that, that tumbled free out of a cereal packet, wasn't it? That's right. Am I allowed to mention Weetabix? Yes. yes. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, your Weetabix packet in those days, when you were a kid, came with a wonderful card, and it was two little flat pictures on a card and you could send away a packet top from Weetabix and one and sixpence and they would send you a stereoscopic viewer to put this card in and to me it was just complete magic you put the card in and suddenly instead of a flat representation you felt you could walk through the window and touch the animals and whatever mm. was in that picture so I was completely hooked and I thought why doesn't everybody do this the whole time so when did you start to actually uh, collect these these vintage sort of Victorian artifacts um, when I wasn't, um, on the poverty line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to go, when I was a student, I used to go to Christie's, which was nearby in South Kensington, and look at all these items for sale in the auctions, and I couldn't possibly bid on any, because I didn't have any money. They were expensive even then, were they? Not that much, but I just didn't have any money. No, yeah. You know, I had enough for fish fingers and that was it. Or cod in a bag, as it was in those days. <laughs> no, and I, w I was quite happy. I never felt the need for money. But, but, and I was able to go to the auctions and experience these things in a way which you couldn't at a museum. At an auction, you could touch them and actually look at them and put them yeah. in viewers. And I developed the knack of free viewing, so I could see them all in 3D without the viewer as well. So I could skim through them and see them all. So I, all my learning was done in auction houses without actually buying anything. What do you mean by yeah, free viewing? That, Is that where, you, where sometimes people... Uh, on the street sell 3D images and they say don't concentrate on it just let it sort of wash over your eyes is it that is that what you mean yes it's a bit like that magic eye technique. yeah is if you relax your eyes you can let the two pictures swim together and I have a website which has been up for a long time called londonstereo.com and there's some instructions there to help you because once you develop the knack it's really easy you can do it all the time you look at two you know stereo pictures side by side you can instantly see them in in three dimensions right and okay. the, 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 uh, the one of the interesting things about looking at the book that came out to me i hadn't realized that, that, that these paintings were sort of you know a big cut one of the people really anticipated the release of the next batch almost like the release of a new queen album or something people were waiting for it Yes, it was very big in Victorian times, and I've been learning actually. I mean, the guy who's driven this is sitting next to me, D Denis Pellerin uh, from France, and um, he's made a study of how this all happened. And you're right, um, people were absolutely devoted to this stuff, and they would wait for the next painting from someone like Millet or whatever. Yeah. They'd be able to see it in a gallery, but they wouldn't be able to take it home. Yeah. And what stereoscopy did was uh, these photographers kind of made a representation of the painting but with real people and photographed it in 3D and the 3D cards could be taken home so they could be studied forever in your living room. So the two things kind of went hand in hand. That's what this book is about. And is that why it's called but, the poor man's picture gallery because you could afford the postcard? Yeah, exactly. And uh, it was said at the time that stereoscopy was the poor man's picture gallery. Yeah. It was kind of insulting but also in a sense, a great tribute, because it did bring art to every man. Well, that's what I was going to say. Was it, was it a success? And, and when did it start to die out? Presumably with moving pictures, was it? 
It was a massive success. Yeah. Um, and the London Stereoscopic Company of the day boasted that it sold a million views, or wow. it had a million views on sale. They had branches in Oxford Street and Regent Street and one in New York. It was huge, yeah, like records. Yeah. Um, it died out sort of, I think, actually not because of movies. It, it died out earlier than that. And it was supplanted by something quite boring called the carte de visite, and I've never figured out why, you know, which is very <laughs> flat and very standard, you know, can't do these little sort of calling cards and they would have a photograph on them and they became massive at about the end of the 1860s. And stereoscopy was kind of forgotten until about 1900 when it became oh. huge again. Oh. Uh, the, the, the good news is that if you buy Brian and Denise's book, you don't have to um, send off to Weetabix to get a viewer because no, it, co it comes, it comes with it. one. It comes, yeah. It's not, it won't even cost you one and sixpence. <laughs> we've, we've been having fun with it in the office this morning. Yeah. It's good. Well, so. I had to do it. You know, there was, yeah. there was no stereo viewer available that would give you the experience. And it's called a Brewster viewer, really. That's, that's what it's modelled on. So David Brewster made, in about 18, mid-1850s, this portable um, stereoscopic viewer, and that's what I modelled mine on, because you can't get them now, obviously. Yeah. And this is made in Sunbury-upon-Thames, moulded out of polypropylene, <laughs> and it's very high quality, as you'll see. Yeah. And, and, um, it folds into the book flat, yeah. but when you, when you fold it up ready for action, it gives you a wonder... It's a focusing stereoscope, so it, it'll work for almost anybody's eyesight. Yeah. And it gives you... It, it's actually much better than free viewing, because it gives you that kind of immersive experience, which is even better, I would say, than what you get at the cinema. <laughs> Well, you can check all this on brianmay.com, but we should also say uh, there's, uh, there's, there's an exhibition at Tate Britain of lots of these cards, isn't there, for, uh, yeah. starting uh, in a couple of weeks, I think, Brian? That's right. We've put it together with the Tate, and um, it's been a very interesting experience, actually, because they hold most of these paintings which influence the stereoscopists of the day. And occasionally it was the other way around. Occasionally the stereoscopic... Um, image would influence the painter so that's yeah. all in the book as well so you'll be able to, to go to the Tate gallery and view things in 3d and also see the yeah. painting wall and it's, yeah, and it runs for six months that, that yeah. uh, exhibition. But the Pumas picture guy, and as he has, what also what's fascinating about it, it doesn't just, it's not just about the trickery of the, 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 not the trickery, the science of the 3D representation. You also get real insight into what that the society was like as well from the pictures themselves. Absolutely, it's an incredible portrait of the time, and you realise that the Victorians were so much like us in mm. so many ways. Mm. You know, they had their fads and their fears mm. and their uh, crazes. So, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's a real glimpse into the past with a lot of meaning, a lot of levels. And you can also see Brian Denis uh, talking about this and signing copies of the book at Cheltenham Literature Festival. That's next Tuesday. And then uh, next um, yeah. uh, Friday, the Royal Photographic Society, I think. Uh, yeah. You'll be on. And then the British Library, uh, the V&A, and 27th of November at St. Swithin's Church in Bath. Uh, uh, Brian, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, you'll see Denis and myself, and we project in 3D. So Great. Great. And Great. there's more info about all of these things, books, and the events at brianmay.com. And, we, um, and we've already heard from you in our music news earlier this week, you and Roger, about the new uh, the, the new old Queen songs, including Michael Jackson, that are, uh, the that new are old finally seen. Yeah, yeah, that's about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah uh, including a lovely track with Michael on it. Yeah. yeah, we've put a lot of work into this, rescuing and restoring. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I feel very proud of the tracks. I'm very excited. Yeah. Um, they sound so fresh and, and, you know, you're actually hearing the four of us playing together, particularly yeah. on Let Me In Your Heart Again, and yeah. Freddie just bursts out Absolutely. as if he's here, Absolutely. which of course he is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, all right, thanks very much.